Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Two Guys in the Bible right here on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. I am William Bell. And uh, today, uh, Don Preston is um, out. Uh, he is traveling at the moment with his lovely wife, Jan. Uh, they wish you a very happy holiday season and uh, send their regards um, and their gratitude and thanks for uh, another year of listening to two guys in the Bible, and we are very grateful uh, for your um, uh, for your presence and for uh, tuning in today um, and throughout the year. Uh, Don is taking his wife to the hospital uh, or to see the doctor because she uh, has, as you know, if you've kept up with the broadcast, she's had some experiences and some bouts with uh, some uh, cancers that have been uh, problematic for her, but have been in remission for the most part, but they did have some uh, sign of some activity, and so they're going to get that checked out. We ask sincerely for your prayers on her behalf that uh, everything will be okay and that they will be able to uh, victoriously uh, move through this episode as they have been in the past. And so we, again, ask for your prayers on their behalf. I want to say to you, uh, once again, um, on behalf of both of us, that we extend our greetings to you through a safe and happy holiday season. We trust and pray that things have been uh, well with you, that you have avoided both the dangers of highway and travel, as well as uh, those which have uh, related to the storms around the country. We know that we've had some severe flooding as well as some uh, severe weather in parts of the country. And of course, uh, recently, people who have lost their lives as a result of some of the tornadic storms that uh, occurred. Uh, and so our prayers and blessings go out to you asking for uh, your comfort, as well as any of those uh, who have families that may have been involved in such conditions. We always know that uh, those are you know, tragic times for us to experience, especially when it comes, you know, during the time of a holiday season and uh, doesn't make, you know, at any time does it make it any better but you know sometimes it seems to hurt us and hit us a little harder you know during these times and so we want to extend uh, a very um, just warm heart of gratitude uh, excuse me of, of um, sympathy to you and thank God that um, those whose lives were spared uh, have been done so and that um, we are on a um, a pathway, that your family is on a pathway to, uh, to recovery uh, through those events. We are today continuing on our study and review of Charles Pogue from the Bellevue Le Lectures, and we're going to continue to talk about John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, and what that means. Uh, it's possibly going to be some repeat, but of course, you know, Don and I are two different people. Uh, while we see alike on many passages, we do have those that sometimes we don't, but that's rare. Uh, and the point is, uh, while we even see the same on many texts, uh, we have different perspectives. We've done different study and arrived at conclusions sometimes in different ways, even though we end up with the same same conclusions. And our methodology and manner of expressing these things are somewhat different, and so uh, you'll just get pretty much the same truths with a little bit of the flavor uh, coming from me. 
and so I'm very grateful for this opportunity and privilege that we have. We have a chat room open, so if you wanted to go in the chat room and type some questions in, uh, I'll do my best to be able to handle that as we monitor the uh, the board and uh, take care of any questions that you may have. Uh, so far, uh, we haven't had any that um, other than uh, a question that was asked us on the previous uh, week. And let me also say that um, last week we were supposed to be on the air, and you probably missed us. That was because I got so preoccupied. I mean, it was just a rare, bizarre thing that happened. But I was so preoccupied in some work that I was doing that I literally forgot the broadcast. I know that's that's embarrassing to admit, but it is the truth, and there's no uh, reason for me to cover it up uh, any uh, any uh, kind of way. That's just exactly what happened. Um, sometimes I can be so intensely focused on things that you know I forget the world around me. Uh, and um, that's what happened. So, uh, you know, I wasn't in a trance or anything. I was just, uh, I, ha I was doing some work and uh, was just keenly focused on doing that particular work until I didn't realize until Don called me about, you know, 20, 30 minutes after and asked what happened and uh, and, and reminded me that we were supposed to be on air. So um, that's what happened. But nevertheless, we're back on track. So we apologize that you missed a broadcast on last week. But hopefully, um, uh, you know, through the various videos and other uh, means that we have to share information with you, that everything was okay. All right, and that you were able to make it through the week. And I'm sure that, you know, there's plenty of information uh, available, but we understand that we, you know, both enjoy being together on these broadcasts as well as having the opportunity to uh, interact with you and to share another message. So let's talk about John 5, 28 and 29 from the perspective of uh, Charles Pogue, who attended the Bellevue Lectures. I believe those were done back in June or July of uh, 2015, where they were uh, studying. Looks like it was around June the 6th or so, or, or, the, or the 15th of June, I think, uh, where they did these lectures on realized eschatology. And so they were taking... Uh, the opportunity to critique our views of eschatology in an attempt to refute them and have pretty much delivered to us, I guess, everything that they felt they needed to say or could say regarding the subject in a, in a way of seeking to refute what we have to say. And really, it's what we believe the Bible says on the subject. I can say for a certainty that as a result of those lectures and of our critiques and review of them, that we have had, you know, just person after person after person uh, contact us, tell us how much they have appreciated the lessons that we have done, uh, the in-depth study that they have received, and how they have come to a much better understanding of covenant eschatology as a result of our critique and our reviews of these lessons. And so we trust and pray that that is going to continue as we continue to move forward, because that is our aim. Now, when we talk about the resurrection, this is, of course, you know, the last of the Mohicans, if you please. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but it's the last of the um, doctrines, if you please, or, uh, you know, positions to fall as a person is doing their study. This is the the holdout. This is the camping ground for those who are studying eschatology, even those who agree with many things that we say. Uh, the reason that they don't move all the way is because they find it very difficult to acknowledge and to accept that the resurrection, what is known in the Bible as, quote, the general resurrection, the resurrection related to the end time, was also fulfilled in 70 A.D. And so this is, of course, the heart of Charles Pogues' um, review and critique and of his complaints against what we have to say. So we're going to just basically take some of the things which he said. I can't remember all of what he said, but I can assure you, uh, for the most part, you know, his presentation, as we were discussing two weeks ago, his presentation on uh, John 5, 28 and 29 was woefully lacking in terms of any 
substantial uh, attack or uh, presentation exegesis of the passage uh, that would do any damage or concern to a fulfilled perspective. So let's go ahead and, and get into that. Now, he starts off by quoting from Job 14 and verse 14. You know, if a man dies, shall he live again? And um, raising that as an issue to somewhat suggest that here is a passage that talks about Job, who was going to be raised out of physical death. And the text says, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. And you shall call, and I will answer you. You shall desire the works of your hands. In verse 14, we acknowledge the passage. It says what it says. It says, all the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. And um, in looking at that text, we don't have any indication here of a bodily resurrection, of a resurrection of a body coming out of the ground. There is not sufficient evidence in that text to support that. Uh, if this is a resurrection passage, um, Daniel Pogue would be hard-pressed to prove that. Uh, all he can do is assume and assert that that's what the text is all about. Uh, the other part of that is, if the text is related to John 5.29, then we don't have to necessarily do an exegesis of Job 14 and 14, because Job 14 and 14 will be taken care of in the exegesis of John 5 and verses 28 and 29. And so from that perspective, I want it to be known and acknowledged that um, we are addressing that text as well in John chapter 5, um, 24 through 29. And therefore, uh, it is, uh, you know, the, te the texts are, would be considered parallel. Now, we also have another passage in Job, which is Job 19. Uh, that has to be taken in consideration with that, because Job says in verse 25, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Now here is a text that also relates to uh, resurrection, and uh, we would suggest to you that if you do some research from the credible scholars, and particularly you could look up, you know, Kyle and Delich on this. Uh, they give you a translation that makes more sense with the text. Sometimes, you know, people read the text, but they don't really contemplate on it. They don't really muse over it. They don't really think about it. And a lot of times, the uh, when you have these so-called alleged contradictions to uh, our view. The answer to them is sitting right there in their face, right in the text, and I believe this is the case with with uh, John, excuse me, with Job uh, 19 and 26, uh, and therefore would be a commentary on Job 14 and verse 14. So in one text he says, "If a man dies, shall he live again? And the day, all the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes." You know, when I look at that text, all the days of my hard service. Will I wait till my change comes? Well, you know, if you look at that text very carefully, uh, to me, if it's the days of his hard service that he's waiting, I think you render your hard service while you are alive. That would be one of the first things I would see with that text, just from a uh, cursory glancing uh, or you know of the text. But again, back to verse twenty-five, when he says, uh, and twenty-six, when he says. I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last, or in the last days, on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. Now, if we are talking about the resurrection here, there's really a problem. Because the common sense of reading this text is probably the reason why Kyle and DeLich and other Hebrew scholars 
translated it in this fashion. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that out of my flesh I shall see God. Because I can assure you that if your skin has been destroyed, you are no longer in your flesh. And that's just common sense coming right off the uh, the surface of the text. All it requires is simply a little slowing down to read it. If you look in the marginal reference, and I have a marginal reference in the text that I have, and the marginal reference actually says that. It says literally struck off. So notice, reading it that way, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is struck off, this I know, that in my flesh, or out of my flesh, I shall see God. So we're talking about a time after Job's demise, after his skin has been struck off, uh, he says, out of his flesh he will see God. And so it is not a text that is teaching that one would see uh, God in his flesh, but rather out his flesh. And we're going to uh, pick that up as we move forward in talking about John five twenty eight and 29. Now, the approach that uh, Charles Pogue has on John five twenty eight and 29 is that it is a resurrection that speaks about um, two resurrections that he styles it. One resurrection, of course, he finds in verses 24 through 27 to be related to man's redemption, to deliverance from sin. And the reason that he concludes that is because of the text that gives a temporal reference. In other words, this particular text says, uh, in verse 24, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. And so, of course, you know, he stops there. Uh, his point is, this is a resurrection of which it was said, the hour is coming and now is. And he laid a particular emphasis on the phrase, now is, meaning that it was something that was um, imminent within the first century generation, that it was something that was occurring in the first century generation, and therefore, uh, because his belief and his teaching and his tradition is that the resurrection of a body coming out of the ground has not yet occurred, and that that resurrection, so-called, relates to a yet future return of Christ that verses 24 through 26 could not possibly be referring to such a resurrection, and therefore it is a resurrection of the, um, of the saints, that it is a resurrection out of sin death, that it is a resurrection relating to deliverance from the bondage of sin and therefore redemption and restoration to God in the first century. Uh, we have no problem with that whatsoever in terms of his relating it to a first century event, nor do we have a problem with his relating it to an event that occurred um, with regard to deliverance from sin death. Uh, we believe that that is exactly what the passage is discussing in John 5, 24 through 26, when he says the hour and now is. As a matter of fact, the emphasis on the time in the text is one of the reasons why, just as he has done, we agree that it is speaking of first century events. Now, the difference between what Charles Pogue 
advocates. And what we are saying is that he uses that term, the hour is coming and now is, to delineate between two resurrections, one which occurred and was spiritual in the first century relating to deliverance from sin death and a yet future physical resurrection of bodies from the ground which has not yet occurred. And therefore he sees this uh, 2,000 year gap almost, or a gap of almost 2,000 years, between what he considers the spiritual resurrection and a bodily or biological resurrection of bodies from the ground. Now, having said that, it's important for us to uh, to examine that a little bit further. And we talked about uh, this problem that permeates the amillennialist view, uh, the view of futurists who want to hold these texts to relate to a future return of Christ. Now, here's one problem that we have and that he was having with the text. Uh, one of the problems he had was the text and the concept of the eternal kingdom being fully established. Uh, he made some remarks and even um, uh, made some, you know, jokes, etc., about being a partially established kingdom in light of the fact that the New Testament teaches that uh, there were those who were called Christians first at Antioch, uh, Acts 11 and verse 26, also uh, Acts um, uh, 28 and um, uh, 26 and 28, excuse me, but also 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16. Of course, Acts 26 and 28, where Agrippa tells Paul, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. And then in 1 Peter 4, he talks about suffering as a Christian. And so his conclusion from that was that if the Bible is already talking about people being a Christian before 70 A.D., then why and how could the kingdom not yet be established? Why is it not yet already in progress? Now, what has happened here is the problem that um, we find in studying eschatology uh, that occurred with the viewpoints of C.H. Dodd and also of Albert Schweitzer. And, you know, sometimes I like to re- remind people of this because it shows how we get uh, two different views from the concept of resurrection and from the concept of eschatology in the Bible. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about the kingdom or salvation or redemption or um, resurrection or any of the uh, major end time or eschatological or redemptive events of the scriptures. They all have the same pattern. Now, here's what happened with C.H. Dodd. C.H. Dodd looked at the New Testament, and he saw such passages that uh, we're dealing with today. The hour is coming, and now is, when those who hear the voice of the Son of God shall hear, and those who hear shall live. He saw a text like that, and he says, here is the end-time resurrection being accomplished in the first coming of Christ. In other words, being associated with Jesus' death on the cross or his ascension at Pentecost, but primarily being fulfilled in the first coming of Christ. And that's precisely what uh, Charles Pogue is doing with the text. He is citing the text and he's saying, you see, this is the already, and therefore it is not the not yet. Uh, That's his concept. The not yet he reserves for a physical body coming out of the ground. And so C.H. Dodd's view of, of um, preterism or of covenant eschatology or of realized eschatology was that all of it, all of the end time passages, things that we know as the end time, which Charles Polk is uh, splitting into two different um, eschatons, if you please, uh, he saw all of that being fulfilled in the first coming of Christ. And therefore, the already, uh, to the exclusion of the not yet. 
And by the not yet, we simply mean that part which was scheduled to be fulfilled when Christ returned. Now, on the other hand, Albert Schweitzer looked at the information, and he saw a passage like John 5, 24 through 29, and particularly verses 28 and 29, uh, when it says that the hour is coming when all that are in the graves will hear his voice, and those who hear will come forth, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting condemnation. And uh, so he said this has not occurred. This relates to a yet future return of Christ, and um, this, therefore, has to be something that relates to the end. And so he, therefore, saw everything eschatological referring to the time of the end or to the end time, which he, of course, assumed was future. And so now we have, you know, these two men of great mental and intellectual stature uh, seeing two things when they go to the Scripture. One sees the first part of John 5 as being fulfilled in the first coming of Christ. He sees the second part as did Charles Pogue as being fulfilled at a time yet future. The difference being with these two men is one took one holy death and resurrection of Christ, etc., and the other one took the latter part to be holy future. So one has one set of uh, of uh, has one paradigm of holy uh, present, meaning all of it present. The other one has uh, this not yet fulfilled perspective of eschatology. Now. What we're suggesting to you is that rather than these being two different concepts, they're actually the same in terms of, um, if you please, the head and tail of the same event. They're actually two sides of the same coin. In other words, there are events which were fulfilled in relation to the first coming of Christ, and by that we don't necessarily mean uh, when he first came into the world but we mean those things that were associated with his first coming up to his death and up to the uh, declaration of those things beginning on the first Pentecost following his death, burial, and resurrection and his ascension. But at the same time, we see the end time events as organically connected to that beginning. We see them in synergy, not in uh, disarray and dichotomization not in separate, separating the two between themselves. They rather refer to uh, one continuous process that has to be completed. And so when we talk about the uh, establishment of the kingdom, one of the things that we are saying concerning the establishment of the kingdom is that it has a beginning toward that state of consummation or being established and it reaches a point called that consummation when all of those things were completed regarding it. And we find that that event is something, and that process was something that took place within the first century. Not part of it, not simply the first part of it, but all of it. And here's an example for you uh, from the, uh, the scriptures. Uh, when we look at a text, for example, like Colossians 1 and verse uh, 13, where it talks about the um, saints being delivered from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, or translated into the kingdom of God. Now, we don't deny that at all. We acknowledge it. But then, when you look at the fact that John the Baptist and Jesus Christ came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and to the people of their day, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. They were announcing the initiation of the kingdom of God and stating that the time had come, that it was near, and therefore the people were required and were obliged to repent that they might prepare themselves for life in the kingdom of God. However, in so doing, we also find that the text mentions the coming of the kingdom being at hand at a time far removed from 
that, that initial inception on the day of Pentecost. For example, in a passage like Luke chapter 21, and the verse is 28, he says, so likewise you, or actually it's verse 31, so likewise you, when you see these things come to pass, know that your redemption is at hand, and he says, know that the kingdom of God has drawn near. Now, according to Mr. Pogue, that would mean that the kingdom of God, in its completion, in its consummation, was already done. And therefore, he would be assuming, and I'm not necessarily ascribing the position to him, but according to his logic, the position of C.H. Dodd would be fulfilled, according to him, because he would take the passage in Luke 21 and verse 31, which talks about a coming of a kingdom after the time of Pentecost and after the time that preceded 70 A.D. to the time of 70 A.D., because it is in that context in which the kingdom of God comes. Now, when we, again, take a look, this concept, we have a beginning for the kingdom in Colossians 1 and 13, or an emphasis on its beginning, but we also have an emphasis on its consummation in Luke 21 and verse 31. This is a problem that Charles Pogue needs to work out, because this is why He's having problems with understanding what the term established means when it relates to the kingdom of God. You see, the word established in the context doesn't simply mean to bring about the beginning or the initiation of something. It means to bring what has begun into its full, mature state to confirm it so that it now uh, stands on its own, it now is a consummated process and therefore completed. And that consummated process did not take place instantaneously, as uh, Charles would want us to believe, but rather it took place over a period of time. It took place over a period of time that can clearly be seen in scriptures. Now, let's take the text in Daniel 2, and of course I'll be back in John 5, 28 and 29 momentarily. But when you look at John chapter 5, and um, or, or rather Daniel chapter 2, and verse 44 and 45, the text says, and in the days of these kings. Now if we're going to be grammatically correct, if we're going to follow the language of the text, the Bible says, in the days of these kings, not in the day of the king, uh, meaning singular, but rather in the days of these kings, the God of heaven would set up a kingdom. And therefore, he is indicating from that text that over a time, uh, that kingdom would be set up. So Daniel 2 uh, and 44, in the days of these kingdoms, the God of heaven would set up a kingdom. Now, when you talk about a kingdom, you're talking about, you know, a king with a law, with subjects, and with territory, over which he reigns, that is his domain, uh, a king domain, that's what kingdom is, you know, the word just contracts to kingdom, but a king's domain, and therefore he would be both expected to, as well as obligated to protect his subjects, and to defend them. And uh, so from that perspective, uh, he has enemies, generally, which was the case until he had squashed them until he had put them down. And therefore, when we read Daniel 2 and verse 44, uh, Daniel alludes to that because of the statement that he makes. He says in verse 44 again, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Notice that phrase, which will never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. Now, here is one very significant uh, action that would take place with the kingdom of God. It would break in pieces and consume all the other kingdoms that were uh, around it and that were uh, a part of the landscape. And so from that perspective, it had a job of defeating its enemies. Now, those enemies were not defeated at the inception of the kingdom. I mean, you're talking about... Uh, something that is as new as the church was on the day of Pentecost. But 
it rather takes place as the kingdom grows to mat- its maturity. You know, sometimes I watch the uh, the big cats on YouTube and uh, the way that they hunt uh, and stalk their prey and, and how successful they are. Well, when their cubs growing up, you know, maybe a couple of years old, et cetera, uh, they start to learn how to hunt and how to tr- track down their prey and how to kill it, et cetera. But they don't have the size, they don't have the body weight, they don't have the skills oftentimes to do it. And um, so they fail in their attempts to go after the animals. And so, and they are very vulnerable to these counterattacks by these animals. It doesn't matter whether it's a hippopotamus or whether it is a, um, uh, one of these wild buffaloes, uh, et cetera. Uh, they all... Uh, and, and could be hyenas or whatever, they are subject to these attacks from uh, their, um, you know, mutual enemies, their arc enemies in terms of, of what goes on with them. And uh, they are not established, if you please, until they get to a point where they not only can uh, take care of, you know, hunting down their food and, and killing food, uh, tracking the prey and, and stalking them and eventually successfully, um, you know, killing them so that they can eat. But they also have to establish themselves as their ranking in the pride. And oftentimes that might mean going up against one of their stark enemies, which would be the older lion. And uh, not until they can do that do, can they establish themselves uh, you know, it means the defeat of all their enemies. That's the concept that we have in Daniel 2 and verse 44. So when we talk about the establishment of the kingdom, we're talking about a time when God defeats all other kingdoms because, of course, that's what the text says, uh, not just the inception or the beginning of the kingdom. So if you continue to read through the text, it says it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass, the dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Now, when you put that together with uh, a text such as um, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7, And by the way, even before we get to Isaiah chapter 9, if you look in Isaiah chapter 2, a text that is often quoted by, you know, these these amillennialists, by uh, these these brothers in the churches of Christ, particularly uh, because we're more familiar with them, uh, you have a text in Isaiah 2 that basically says the same thing, and they teach the same process, they teach the same concept that I've just demonstrated in talking about the church. Because in Isaiah 2 and verse 1, the text says the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. Now notice, not in a latter day, but in the latter days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. Now ask yourself the question, did all nations flow to the kingdom of God, on the day that it began. No, only one nation uh, flowed to it, and that was the Jewish nation. Sure, they had come from every nation out of heaven, but it was only one nation. Not all nations came on that day. So the kingdom could not be fully established on that day. As a matter of fact, in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, James and Peter have a conversation about what was required in order that the rest of men, the residue of men, might seek the Lord. In other words, if all nations had to flow to the kingdom, not until that was made possible could it in fact occur. Hence the reason for Peter going to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 and teaching them the gospel and the confirmation that the apostles make of it in uh, in Acts chapter 15. For example... In verse 12, it says, you know, after they've had this controversy over the keeping of the law and the keeping of the Sabbath, etc., the Bible says in verse 12, Then all the multitude kept silent, 
and listen to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. Now, there are some who want to take that from the perspective of Amos 9 and verse 15, when it was written, but no Gentiles were brought into the kingdom. As a matter of fact, that was the time that judgment by the Assyrians had been taken on uh, the northern tribes. But in this case, James starts the text from the time when he says, listen to me, Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that the residue or the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Now to, uh, known to God from eternity all his works, therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. So notice, they started to turn to God after the gospel had gone to them, and therefore this was the application of the prophecy in the establishing of the kingdom in the top of the mountains, from Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2. And, um, and so he says, many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, I want to stop at that point because between the next verse and Isaiah 9, there is a common element that is found in Daniel 2, in Isaiah 2, and in Daniel, uh, excuse me, in Isaiah 9. That is a common thread in all of these passages as it relates to the establishment of the kingdom. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, for those who are not aware, when you talk about the kingdom of God, you're talking about resurrection. Why do I say that? This is a point that seemingly no one takes the time to really even uh, consider. I won't say no one. I will say many. But if you read 1 Corinthians 15, when the Bible is discussing the resurrection, one of the points made by Paul is this. Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What's the context? It's resurrection. What's the point? Inheriting the kingdom of God is equivalent to Resurrection. Now let's ask Mr. Pogue if he's going to affirm the resurrection of John 5, 24 through 26 is the same resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. And he's going to deny it. He's going to run from it as though it were a handful of of hot firecrackers that have been lit because he knows that it will blow his position out of the water. He knows that 1 Corinthians 15 that speaks of inheriting the kingdom is a future text to the day of Pentecost following the death of Jesus Christ. But you see, that's where Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, and Isaiah 9 were focused when they talked about the establishment of the kingdom. Let me pull in Daniel chapter 9. And I'm going to get to the text in John 5. Man, I tell you, the time goes so fast. 
uh, it's just it's just unreal that um, you know I can sit and um, not say a word <laughs> and um, listen to Don all day, and then when I have to do a text by myself, it seems like the time just absolutely uh, just flows by so very quickly. At any rate, we're going to go on in Isaiah nine, starting in verse uh, six. Isaiah, speaking of the kingdom and of the Son of God, says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Another important point that we have to make in this discussion on the end time of the increase of his government, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. Now, please understand that the kingdom of God, according to Isaiah 9 and verse 7, would be established with judgment and judgment from that time even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Now, what do you find as a common thread in Daniel 2, 44 and 45, in Isaiah chapter 2, and in Isaiah 9, as well as 1 Corinthians 15 and John 5, 28 and 29? You find... The concept of judgment. See, that's the part of establishment that our brethren can't accept. They can't acknowledge. They can't deal with. Isaiah 2 doesn't stop or end with verse 2 or even verse 3. It takes us all the way through to the concept of judgment for the establishment of the kingdom. It says, after stating that the word of the Lord would go from Jerusalem, he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords in the plowshares and their spears in the pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's the time that Isaiah 9 says from that time forward, the kingdom would be established forever. Why? Because according to Daniel chapter 2, all of its enemies have been defeated, including the last enemy, which was death. Now, let's go on over to John 5, 28 and 29, because the time is swiftly getting away from us. And I certainly want to make these points from the text in order to um, show very clearly what this text is, uh, is stating. Now, as, I, as we said, we acknowledge the fact that John 5, 28, or 24 through 26 was talking about a resurrection out of sin death. But you see, John 5, 28 and 29 is a quotation from Daniel chapter 12. How can we miss that? How could Daniel Pogue miss that in his exegesis of the passage? Why would he attempt to interpret the text without pulling in the Old Testament background for the text. And especially later on in the text, Jesus makes this statement. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So if Christ said, search the scriptures, what scriptures was he talking about? He was talking about the Old Testament scriptures. What was the subject of his request for them to search the scriptures, eternal life. What does Daniel have to say about eternal life? He says it is in connection with resurrection. Daniel actually places it in the text that has all of the elements 
that we find in John 5, 28 and 29. And now comes the question of whether Daniel Pogue is honest in exegeting the passage. Or is he doing a Passover of one of the most critical elements that he himself has used in order to establish the first century application of verses 24 through 29? In other words, he uses a temporal indicator to assure us, and rightly so, that verses 24 through 26 are referring to a first century event. We take our hats off to him. And with his enthusiastic audience, say amen. Daniel Pogue, you have done yourself both a great service and a disservice. A great service in that you acknowledge that time was the factor that caused you to interpret John 5, 24 through 26 as a spiritual resurrection out of sin. But in your zeal to destroy the view of covenant eschatology, you ran straight past the same time indicator in verses 28 and 29. Now, if you are an amillennialist listening to this broadcast, or if you are any kind of ism or ist in terms of futurism, Charles Pogue has laid out the seeds of the refutation of a future bodily, meaning biological, resurrection in verses 28 and 29 using the very same hermeneutic and logic that he used in verses 24 through 26. I don't know of a premillennialist, a postmillennialist, a partial preterist, an amillennialist who does not understand that John 5, 28 and 29 is a quote, a direct quote from Daniel chapter 2, I mean chapter 12, verse 2 and verse 3. Now that, my friend, has very serious implications. Let's take a look in the time we have remaining. I cannot believe I'm down to six and a half minutes for the rest of the broadcast. What a shame. The Bible says, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble. And you should read that as the appointed time from the uh, Greek term in the Septuagint, Kairos. And there shall be a time of trouble. That's the great tribulation. That is the affliction of Matthew 24 and verse 21. And Jesus quotes it from Daniel chapter 12. And he says, such as never was since there was a nation. What nation was Daniel writing to? Not the United Nations, not America. He was writing to the ancient Israel nation, of which he was a part, further delineating the prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks. He says, even to that time, and at that time, wait a minute, and at that time, why is it that Mr. Charles Pogue would not in all of his 45 minutes of exegesis bring in the very text from which Daniel, uh, uh, John 5, 28 and 29 is quoted. At that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book 
Now that takes you to Revelation chapter 20, which is also a parallel to John 5, 28 and 29. They all dovetail right back into Daniel chapter 12. Now watch what he says in verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. When? At that time. What was that time? The time of the great tribulation. The time that was unparalleled to any other time in Israel's nation. Or in Israel as a nation. That Jesus quoted. Saying that had that time not been shortened, no flesh would have been saved. And guess what Mr. Pogue will argue for Matthew 24 and verse 21. He, along with all of his brethren will argue that Matthew 24, 21 was fulfilled in 70 A.D. according to Matthew 24 and verse 34. Well, what does that mean? It means that since Matthew 24, 21 equals Daniel 12 and verses 1 through 3, or the entire chapter for that matter, but particularly Daniel 12, 1, and since Daniel 12 is inseparably connected to Daniel, uh, Daniel 12, 1 is inseparably connected to Daniel 12, 2. And since Daniel 12, 2 is John 5, 28 and 29, Charles Pogue must answer to be consistent using his same hermeneutic that Daniel 12, 2, the resurrection out of the dust which he would argue as the graves in John 5, 28 and 29, occurred in connection with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. He has no answer for that. He cannot uh, in any wise refute that. By the way, some years ago, Glenn Hitchcock, who is also another preacher among them, did a study on uh, Daniel 12, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, Doug McClish as well in the Bellevue Lectures. But I can't remember if Doug McClish took it all the way. I know that Glenn Hitchcock did. Glenn Hitchcock said there was no way possible that Daniel 12 2 referred to a future resurrection, but that it referred to 70 A.D. Well, Daniel 12 2 is John 5 28. And John 5 28 is 1 Corinthians 15. And 1 Corinthians 15 is Revelation 20. And Revelation 20 is 1 Thessalonians 4. And these guys have not a clue of what they're saying on resurrection. Now, oh, I'd love to get into more of this. 90 seconds left. Let me say this. Here's the problem with Charles Pogue, and I made this point with a gentleman by the name of Carl Albert, who's trying to argue a similar point. And he wants to run to 1 Corinthians 15. But here's the problem with that. 1 Corinthians 15 says the opposite of what these guys are saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this. It says, first the natural, then the spiritual. First the natural, then the spiritual. First the natural, and according to them, that would be a bodily resurrection. Afterward, the spiritual. What do these guys say? First the spiritual, and then the natural. That's a direct contradiction, ladies and gentlemen. It's an ungetoverable problem that they cannot extricate themselves, and they want to tell us we have a problem. Let me make this last point, and I'm going to close. I don't have enough time, but I'm going to take the time, so give me just a few seconds. To pull it all together, to show you that the time and the hour, which Mr. Pogue wants to deny, is also in Daniel chapter 12, and it is in John 5, 28 and 29, is found in the parallel text to that in Romans 13, 11 and 12. This was a text that Kenneth Gentry, who is a postmillennialist, tried to use to argue against the term at hand, thus a first century application referring to the eschatological or end time resurrection. In Romans 13, 11 and 12, the Bible says, And do this 
knowing the time that now, see, there's the term now, just as it was in John 5, 24 through 26, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the hour of light. He says the hour, the last hour, had come. That is the same hour of Daniel, of Daniel 12, of John 5, 28 and 29. And if it means first century in verses 24 through 29, it means first century in verses, I mean, in verses 24 through 26. It means first century in 28 through 29. Well, I don't know what Mr. Poe can say after that. Uh, it just destroys his position. Uh, we hope and pray that he will take note of that. Others who support that teaching will step back, take a look at their hermeneutic, and understand how faulty it is. With that, I want to say Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, we look forward to being back with you on the next year. May God bless you. May he keep you. Until the next time, I'm William Bell saying God bless and good night. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Don Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.